Welcome to Proclaiming Justice, a podcast from PJTN that focuses the light of truth on vital issues in today's headlines that impact every American. I'm your host, Laurie Cardoza Moore, founder and president of Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, and I'm here to educate, motivate, and activate you to action. I want to arm you with the truth and the facts you'll need to fight and preserve our constitutional republic and uphold the Judeo-Christian values our nation was founded upon. Welcome to Proclaiming Justice, a PJTN podcast where we shine the light of biblical truth on vital issues from today's headlines that impact every American, Jew and Christian, people of faith, and people of conscience. I'm your host, Laurie Cardoza Moore. On this week's podcast, we are going to continue our conversation about critical race theory and its impact on our judicial system. Joining me back on the podcast today is PJTN Senior Academic Fellow, Dr. Sandra Alfonsi. To help inform our audience about this threat to our children and our republic. If you missed the last episode of this podcast, you will find it and our previous podcast lineup on our website at pjtn.org, as well as all the other platforms that you use to access your favorite podcasts. I also want to remind you to listen and share this and all of our previous podcasts with your family and friends so that they can become more informed about this and other related issues. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome back to Proclaiming Justice, Dr. Sandra Alfonsi. Dr. Alfonsi, welcome back. Well, thank you very much, Lori. Um, Welcome to everyone, and I'm very happy to be back. And somehow I I always would like one time that I'll do this with, (laughs) with Lori and we'll have something happy to do. But this podcast is not about happy. This podcast is about critical race theory. A continuation yeah. of the dialogue, as she said, and the legal system. And with Lori's permission, what I want to start with is that in the year 2020, and you realize we're 2022, critical race theory became mandatory education in America's law schools. And that in itself, when you make something like critical race theory mandatory, it it started me to think about how we had an appointment to a, of a justice to the Supreme Court who believes mm-hmm. that the Constitution is racist if she says it is racist or she sees it as racist. That I could not understand how we arrived at, at a point where someone who is appointed to the Supreme Court outright says that the Constitution is racist, not based on on any of the premises or any of the amendments, but based on the sentence that it is racist if she considers it racist. And Mm -hmm. it bothers me because education is supposed to be objective and not subjective. And Mm -hmm. objective is supposed to lead us to facts. It is supposed to lead us to factual analysis of history, of the period in which history took place. And all of these things, when you substitute objective to subjective, and it does destroy the essence of a legal system, it also destroys the history of the country because it is rewritten through the eyes of, not through the eyes of truth or the eyes of history, no no matter how bad or how warped the history was, it is written through the eyes of people. And when we look at critical race theory, and this is something which I I finally understand about it, mm-hmm. for those who are the oppressors, that is to say, white Americans, the, the majority, let's be blunt about it because that's what it is. That's what it believes and that's what it teaches from kindergarten up. And the people of color, known as the pox, the people of color, are those who are oppressed. Whereas Mm -hmm. white society has been studying all of this through Mm -hmm. objectivity or objective objective history, trying very hard to come to conclusions why something took place based on the period of time, the the scope of the the problem. Mm -hmm. Objectivity means taking into 
fact or finding the facts of what the let's say the author of a book what his life what his life was like but what the period of time was like in which he lived the mm -hmm. same thing the constitution with the founding fathers right. however right. the critical race theory does not say that right so let's just for just quickly um dr alfonsi just for our audience because critical race theory is still an anomaly to most people. Most people don't completely understand what CRT or critical race theory is and, you know, its influence in curriculum across the board. And more recently, we saw this with math curriculum. But this is literally a, a, a Marxist takeover of the United States of America. They have created the oppressor and the oppressed. What is critical race theory? Just in just for a general, so people understand, because I think a lot of people are still confused about what CRT is because they still hear the rhetoric that, oh no, we teach this in college. We're not teaching this in the classroom. And we just saw this past week that Governor DeSantis just threw out 41% of the textbooks submitted by textbook publishers because they were riddled with not just Common Core, but CRT. So on a basic level for the average person on, in our audience that's listening, what is CRT? Critical race theory is the, the destruction of a white society. The critical race theory is that racism is not as we understand it. Racism is in fact that the white majority has is oppressing the black minority. Mm -hmm. And that everything that the whites have done to bring equality and not equity, but to bring equality and to straighten the balance in America between black Americans and white Americans that everything done by the Constitution, everything done in this country has been, while it did in effect in some way benefit the Amer Black Americans, critical race theory teaches that everything that has been done through the Constitution, through the law, that it's not, the law is not neutral. The law does what it does in order to benefit the white majority, benefit the how the the history of the United States and the power of the United States is seen abroad and to make sure that it keeps white America as a superpower. Mm -hmm. And that in effect, what, what was accomplished, let's just use that word, what was accomplished in, the, in America from the time of the constitution when the founding fathers opened the door mm -hmm. to the equalization, to the equality between of all citizens, and were, they were very strong on the fact that while there are rights for the non-citizens, the important part at the beginning was to ensure rights for American citizens. And they, they that was when finally the American Blacks were given suffrage, the women were given suffrage and such. Critical race theory deconstructs, that's their verb, it deconstructs, it takes apart, it took apart, and it's what it does is to reverse the role, the American, the, the whites are the oppressors and the blacks are the oppressed. Okay, that seems logical if you have majority and minority, but right. what, they, what they do, and this is what they teach, is that nothing that the white, the, nothing that white America does is done for any reason other than promoting themselves and therefore they, critical race theory puts black Americans into the into a different type of a ghetto by showing them that everything, nothing is, they, they don't believe in, the critical race theory does not believe that rights, that wrongs are righted by raising the level of education. They believe that, that everything that a, a superior white student earns must be given to the black student, whether whether superior, average, or below average. And that is the basis of critical race theory. 
you are a racist if you do not accept that definition. Mm -hmm. And and what critical race theory promotes itself as the anti-racism. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Well, you know, it, it's totally yes. it totally defies what Martin Luther King preached and believed and inspired America. You know, you, there was a recent article, that groundbreaking piece on the legal system by Aaron Sabarium. But he wrote this piece on America being at risk of becoming a totalitarian nightmare. And it's he is tying it back to what's happening in the law schools, the trend that's happening in the law schools. And you have recently stumbled upon this. And this is critically important, ladies and gentlemen, because our, our legal, the future legal leaders are being trained and equipped in an adversarial legal system and they're basically um, trying to destroy America and our beliefs, our foundation, our, our laws, our system of government based on this critical race theory mindset. It's, very, it's a very dangerous trend. I wanted to add something to what you said, Lori, about Martin Luther King. And I think that all of your listeners have to understand it because I grew up in the era when Martin Luther King was considered a hero. He was, uh, we followed him. And when he was assassinated, we mourned for him. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the civil rights movement would never have succeeded in starting to correct the inequities because there are inequities across the United States in everything. Mm -hmm. But what, what saddens me and angers me is that both the Black Lives Matter movement and especially now critical race theory, they have not only, they not only do not support it, they have alienated black Americans from Martin Luther King as one of their leaders, as one of the, as, as one of the examples of how you progress and how you fight. And it isn't fighting like Black Lives Matter fights, and it's not fighting like like the critical race theory, if the if those theorists had remained overseas, and it's it would have had a Marxist revolution. They realize that you can't do a Marxist revolution in the meaning of the word revolution. So they came mm-hmm. here to plant a different revolution. But the damage mm-hmm. to the American black community in the alienation of the of the the older ones, the older black blacks, basically still. Uh, hold hold Martin Luther King in reverence. The younger generations do not. And the leaders of CRT come out openly to say that they do not adhere, they do not follow, they do not accept the civil rights movement as it was directed. And that saddens me because they, they in effect, have taken away what the American Black community lacked were, or was missing mm-hmm were leaders of stature who believed in being part of the society. And Martin Luther King was such a person. He believed right. in in righting these wrongs, but not through not through violence. So the critical race theory, now what you said about the academia is something that mm-hmm. your your readers, I want your your listeners to understand too, that yes, it was born in academia because mm-hmm. there were those who wanted the revolution and understood that it couldn't be as it was in Russia and in China, that they, they were here, they came to the States and they, it started, I think of this whole thing, because as an academic, I, I look at it this way, that, mm-hmm. that critical race theory was born in a, petri, in a Petri jar, a Petri dish in academia, in the, in mm-hmm. the halls of Ivy. And they, these professors produced these theories, but most theories get get through society, trickle down. In other words, it starts in academia and then it trickles down. The revolution right. was com- is completely different. This mm-hmm. is not a trickle down. This is so. Let me just real quick, Doctor. Yeah, let me let me just interject here. So what you've just said is that we are no longer a country like what Martin Luther King um, preached 
and, and inspired America to not judge one another based on the color of our, our skin, but we have created a culture where race and gender and identity are more important than due process, where, where we have the presumption of innocence and the rule of law. Correct, but it, one other thing you, you really need to add to, your, to the final part of your sentence, it's that what they have created is also um, a system and let's put the due process a little bit to the side, they have created a system that eliminates or does not accept mediocrity. They have created a system of not equality, but equity. The grade you, that the white privilege gets must be given. They are these, they, it is the due to the, to the people of color. And the mm -hmm. fact that they do not accept mediocrity, you cannot grade a student you cannot grade it as grade the student as once was done. That then goes on to due process when we're talking about the law of the law of the land. But if you take it as an academic petri dish, which starts not at the top, but is plants critical race theory at the elementary school, I I think it's more first grade than kindergarten. But let's give them credit for also getting into the kindergarten. The seeds of critical race theory, the seeds are planted by having, instead of two children looking at each other and looking for their similarities, they have placed everything on the color of the skin is what de everything depends on. You don't get a job based on your merits because they don't believe in meritocracy and they don't believe in in bringing up, if it's mediocre education, mediocre education, bringing up the level. They believe that they they instill in the children, so it's growing upwards. They instill in the children that the only thing that matters is the color of the skin. And therefore the people of color are the ones that are oppressed and the white, when they, and it, that it is a it is a race based problem, and mm -hmm. that's what it is. And then yes, the constitution, the everything that's in the constitution, due process of law, has is basically being eliminated in the right. in the law school, then in the law offices, and then in the courts because we have to judge it that way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and if you would. It, it, you know, if you would ask me a question, how is this happening? Uh, it has to be not trickle down. It can't come from the highest level, which is graduate school, law school, and then go down. It has to be implemented from elementary school on where parents understand that if their children want to respond in any way different from the line that the teacher is teaching, their children will be punished for that and they will be held back. And so starting in elementary school, it isn't the, the desire to study hard in order to improve and be the best. It is a toe the line or you will be punished for. So that, that is something which is critical because if you take it from elementary to middle school to high school, where parents say, just write down the answers, write down what the teacher says, it doesn't matter. Parents need to understand that th this is indoctrination. This That's isn't right. do this to save your, to save your to, as the kids would say, to save your butt. It isn't that. It's indoctrination. And that's why I compare it to the people. That is what we're looking at. We're looking at indoctrination via the threat of fa failure. Not failure because you aren't, you aren't meeting the standards. You failure because you are questioning and then in the other half of the questioning is you are trying to put facts instead of subjective opinions. And critical race theory says that the people of color must be allowed to study and to give answers based on their life experience. Right. And that is like you have the oral Torah and the written Torah right. and the oral Torah, right. the oral Torah, and you have this same phenomenon, except for the right. fact these pe these people, these are American blacks, but these people 
who are they're giving the allowance to to speak through their memory and that they were not alive. They didn't have much discourse from great grandparents and such about what it was like to be a slave. Yes, there were some and there were documents left. Mm -hmm. But this is this is the essence of it, that they are to be allowed to, I say, it's to fantasize. I mean, I right, that's right. fantasize right. history and to fantasize what was done to them and to their to their uh, ancestors. And it is subjective education mm -hmm. and that and not objective. Right, right. Well, Dr. Alfonsi, um, we we're going to have to continue this conversation next week. Ladies and gentlemen, um, this is critically important information. This is a dangerous trend that we're heading into. And we need to be informed so that we can stand in our communities against this onslaught. They are not backing down. I just saw a report where the states that have received COVID funds that haven't used those COVID funds toward COVID, they're using, they're redirecting that money toward implementing critical race theory in these states. So we have got to stay on top of this. We have an election coming up this year. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to know who you are voting for. And I don't care if it's your your uh, congressional member, um, a, a senator, in, in, the, in the federal government, whether it's in the state legislature, whether it's your county officials, your um, school superintendents, you need to know where these elected officials stand. You need to pick up the phone. You need to ask them, where do they stand on the issue of critical race theory? Because if our leadership in our communities and in our states are going to tolerate this, then ladies and gentlemen, that should tell you who you aren't going to be voting for. So I just want to, I want to encourage you all to go to our website to learn more about how to take back local control of your children's education. Ultimately, it starts with you. If you are interested in hosting a summit in your community to help educate, motivate, and activate your county to flip your school board, these school board races are critically important, ladies and gentlemen. Now is the time to do this. This is an election year, and now is the time to act. I hope you all enjoyed this program. We will post this podcast on our, our website and all of our podcast platforms so that you can share with your family and friends. You have to get the word out, ladies and gentlemen. As PJTM Watchmen, we have a biblical mandate to stand against the ungodly rising Marxist threat that is destroying this nation and threatening our Judeo-Christian values. We cannot remain silent. God warned the prophet Ezekiel about the silence and the responsibility of the watchman to alert the people. Once we know, we have a responsibility to share that information. And if you share that, if, if you share that information and your community doesn't listen, then if it says in the Bible, God told the watchman, if you warn the inhabitants and they refuse to heed your warning, if any innocent blood is shed, it's going to be required of them. However, but if you see the enemy advancing and you fail to warn the inhabitants and innocent people die or their blood is shed, it will be required of you. Please, ladies and gentlemen, we have limited amount of time. We have um, uh, elections, like I said, elections that are coming up. We have primaries that are coming up. You have to be informed. You need to pick up the phone and call these candidates Call, call these incumbents and find out where they stand on this. Because silence, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer reminded us, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. So in closing, don't forget to join us for next week's podcast as we continue this conversation about combating the rise of anti-Semitism and taking back local control of our communities and our children's education with Dr. Sandra Alfonsi. I also want to remind you that if you have not signed up, signed up to become a BJTM Watchman, you can help support this effort and more programs like this for just $20 a month. So all you have to do is just go to the website, 
PJTN.org. Sign up to get on the list. With your generous monthly donation, you can ensure that PJTN remains on the front lines and in the headlines, but we can't do it without your faithful prayers and financial support. I hope that you will prayerfully consider supporting our mission as we educate to activate Jews, Christians, and all people of conscience to stand on the front lines of this all-encompassing war. And God bless you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for all of you who have emailed me your messages, listening to our podcast. God bless you. On behalf of our Jewish brethren, the state of Israel, and of course, these United States. Thank you again for joining me on this edition of Proclaiming Justice. Please share this podcast with your family and friends. For more information about how you can get involved, please visit our website at pjtn.org. As a PJTN watchman, you can help us keep up the fight to preserve our freedom for our children and their children for such a time as this.